Now, Executive Suites with WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Touchdown confirmed. We're safe on Mars. When the Mars rover Curiosity touched down on the red planet, NASA officials weren't the only ones celebrating. Employees at Yardney Technical Products were cheering too. They made the high-tech battery that powers the rover. The 68-year-old company is headquartered in Connecticut, but not for long. It's moving to East Greenwich with help from the EDC. This week on the first half of Executive Suite, Yardney Technical Products Chairman and CEO Richard Scabelli. Then, with a stubbornly high jobless rate and an economic development debacle, what should be done to support entrepreneurs? On the second half of Executive Suite, Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce President Lori White. Welcome to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Richard, thanks for being here today. My pleasure. Was there cheering at your uh, office as well when Curiosity landed? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So um, I th this is so neat, the, the whole story around this, but I want to just get people up to speed. Just tell me the basics. What do you do at Yardney Technical Products? Well, we design from the cradle, so to speak, very high-tech batteries, uh, such as what's on Mars right now. But we power, power a variety of uh, satellites, a variety of... Uh, uh, terrestrial applications and undersea uh, applications. For example, the seals run around their little underwater speedboats to get into... Navy the, seals, we're Na talking about it. Navy <laughs> seals. Navy seals, exactly. Our heroes. Uh, we power their sleds that get them into bad so, places. So it's primarily uh, it's federal contracting we're talking about mostly. Pretty much federal contracting. Most of our work is that way. Now is it a lot of it NASA with like Mars or is it mostly in the defense sector? Um, most of it is the defense sector. Yeah. We do uh, we power unmanned drones for example. Yes. Uh, that's do their thing for sure. CIA etc. And uh, a variety of uh, like the B2 Mm -hmm. and a variety of satellites, even recoverable satellites. So do each of these need a different battery or is it you can, you know, you make great batteries that can be plugged into all these different types of uh, fancy machines? No, unfortunately everything is pretty much designed for the application. Mm -hmm. now, that's fortunate for us, but <laughs> there's nothing off the shelf, so to yeah. speak. So everything is designed specifically for the application, generally because the designers finally decide, oh, we need a battery. <laughs> right. Better find How are we going to power this? Yeah. And when they find a spot, you know, we have to configure something that is going to work. So you can't stick a Duracell into a drone before it goes over Afghanistan. No, we're, we're uh, <laughs> not to say anything about Duracell, of course. you know, not being a fine company, but uh, we're in a must-work business. Mm -hmm. When we launched the Mars lander, for example, uh, I think we had 16 batteries on the launch vehicle. One of them doesn't work. Well, one doesn't have to necessarily, and that's a range safety one, but uh, the rest of them, they don't work. Nothing happens. Yeah. Things and can't send anything back. Can't same move case around. on the rover itself. No mm -hmm. battery, no heart. So, uh, how long has the company been around? You're in Connecticut right now, and uh, how many people you employ over there? About 160. Yeah. And we've been around since 1944. Mostly engineers, are we talking about? We're pretty much we're heavily engineering oriented, mm -hmm. very heavily. And uh, is the manufacturing done through you too? Yes. Mm -hmm. We do our own. Uh, but about 30 percent of our so your annual sales are R&D, mm -hmm. um, which keeps us on the cutting edge of technology. Mm -hmm. um, um, so I was looking through the uh, explanations. The day in Connecticut did some great coverage of your uh, batteries in the Mars rover. Their description, their their simple description of the battery was an advanced high energy density lithium ion and silver zinc cells and batteries. Um, for, for the li <laughs> even you even, that even you missed it yeah um, you know but then they were talking about torpedoes the B2 bomber missiles for Trident submarines is it all batteries and and how big are we talking about sort of these, these sorts of machines well it varies as far as size and volume is concerned but most of the, the, what we produce is very high energy density stuff it's not like your automobile battery mm -hmm. it's, uh, or a MacBook battery right. with the lithium we, we, we took a nickel cadmium battery out of the B2 and put in a lithium ion battery in the same position. I mean, mm -hmm. it was a plug in, plug in replacement. And um, we increased the capacity on board five times, which is incredible. How long have lithium ion batteries been available in, in things like the B2? Have well, they been we, using them? We've been pretty much 
along with the pioneers, and it's been about 20 years. About 20 years, yeah. So it's pretty mature. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a mature technology, and uh, there are new ones coming down the pipe. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of research being done on new materials and to get, let's say, less expensive. Mm -hmm. But um, and how do you keep how do you keep tabs on that? Is that the R and D department's job to kind of watch what's the next big thing in lithium ion? Exactly. We we keep abreast of it and we go chase money everywhere, just like everybody else, <laughs> trying to demonstrate that it's feasible, et cetera. So uh, you, you touched on it a bit there, but l let's get into the heart of what you did for the Mars rover. I think I read 18 of your products are in are involved in the Mars rover project from, you said that in the rover itself up on Mars right now, buzzing around right. to the things to get it up there. Uh, and it's all just to make sure everything uh, was powered, right? Exactly. Yeah. Everything. And uh, how long were you working on the project, the rover? Well, this goes back a long time. The Air Force funded us years ago, uh, about 16, 17 years ago, on a, to develop a capability that was applicable to a number of platforms, including the B-2, including uh, uh, the Mars uh, programs. We've made five, four actually, actually four shots to Mars. And uh, we have two other rovers running around up there now. Well, one is stuck in a sand trap. <laughs> That's not the battery's fault. No, it has a bad bearing <laughs> in the wheel. And the other one's still roaming around. It was a 90-day mission, and they've been up there eight and a half years. There must be an enormous number of, um, of different companies working on these projects. That then is, is, is it almost like you're all subcontracts to NASA working on different pieces? Like, you guys do the battery, and you got to talk to the people making the case that's around it and everything else? Well, in this particular case, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, uh, is the technical advisor uh, to the Air Force and NASA. And the general contractor was um, Lockheed. And uh, everybody would work under Lockheed's umbrella with the guidance coming out of JPL. And is, do you have any connections with the other, the rest of the defense industry down here between Newport and, and Groton with the subs or anything? All of them. All of them. So you all work with all. So it's, it's not yeah. a bad place to if be. If anybody in the world wants a, a high tech specialty battery, they know about us. We're the pioneers. Anybody who's in this business started as a licensee of Yardney, going way back. So the world knows about us, and we work for multiple different foreign countries and um, different foreign companies. And every company you can imagine in the United States, whether it's government or otherwise. And everyone needs, needs some power. All right, we've got to take a break. When we come back, why Yardney is bucking the trend and moving to Rhode Island. Stay with us. You're watching Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. Our guest this week, Richard Scabelli. He's chairman and CEO of Yardney Technical Products, and uh, their claim to fame in the last few weeks, they are making, they made the batteries for the Mars rover Curiosity. But uh, more local claim to fame around here is the fact that you are moving to Rhode Island from Pocketuck, Connecticut, right? You're, you've been there since the 60s, you told me, uh, off air. And uh, new facility on South County Trail in East Greenwich. Uh, formerly, people might remember on semiconductors and cherry semiconductors were there. It's empty now. What's the status on the move? How, when do you expect to be up and running in a, a Rhode Island company? Well, we acquired the facility a little over a year ago. It was gutted completely. So we had a complete build out to do. That's why it's been such a delay. It's pretty much complete now. So now it's the strategy of moving the equipment. And in our business, it's required that we maintain production capability while we're moving. Mm -hmm. So we have to be in production there before we start production up north. And then we have to verify that the production up north hasn't changed since it was moved from Connecticut. So it's a, you're basically duplicating your effort, yeah. which is a little bit of a chore. Um, th it's going to surprise a lot of people at home to hear that you're moving to Rhode Island. There's, there are a few states probably that are more down on their business climate than Rhode Island, and we're always hearing about companies not wanting to come here and not coming here. You are doing the opposite. Uh, just what was your thinking? What's the reasoning? I'm sure there's specific reasons that, that Rhode Island was the right choice. Well, uh, put it bluntly, we were in a position that a move was necessary. We were located in a, an old mill. Um, was not exactly the greatest image in the world. Uh, we're growing into other markets and we needed to upscale and we did not own the other facility and it was time to, to move on. 
So it was a matter of how far can we commute for my employees. And I just drew a semicircle for 30 miles and there was nothing available in Connecticut. And uh, this particular facility was right on the edge of the 30 miles. And we've structured a decent deal with it and motivated us to move. And of course, the EDC was very instrumental in that. And you never considered moving down south or, or to Houston or something like that near to NASA? I did, but I have very key people, very talented people. Uh, I would guess that they're solicited and trying to be pirated by my competition every day. And the thought of moving to Houston, if I was one of them, I'd say, well, why would I want to go to Houston? Why wouldn't I go to San Diego or wherever? And they have their choice of going pretty much anywhere in the world. Now, are you looking at a lot of growth, do you think, in the coming years? Do you think you're, you know, you're expecting a, an increase in revenue? Are you seeing new markets open up? You sort of alluded to that. Yes, we do. We've been working on a number of programs that uh, have a, a lot of opportunity for the future. And they should be popping here in the next year or two, depending on what happens with the budgets, et cetera. And we've seen budget cuts all over the world mm -hmm. because of the, the climate of what's going on is sure. incredibly negative. The EDC you mentioned, the Economic Development Corporation, guaranteed a $6 million loan to your company to finance relocation. Webster Bank provided the funding, I believe. Um, I'm curious, sort of, the EDC people is another thing that gets lined a lot here. Uh, what was your interaction with the EDC like? Did you reach out to them? Did they reach out to you? And, and how helpful were they? And how were they helpful to you specifically? Well, frankly, EDC chased us for a number of years, uh, trying to get us up there, you know, because we've been playing with this idea for a while. And uh, it came to the point we had to do it. And we embraced their, their interest, and we put together a structure to deal that made sense. And um, frankly, much more sense than anything that Connecticut could come up with. Mm -hmm. So would you have been able to do the move if you hadn't had the, the guarantee from the, from the state agency? Uh, yes, we're a very strong fi company financially, and mm -hmm. the bank would have handled the deal without the EDC involved. Um, it just made it a structure that made more sense for us from a long-term standpoint. And how rigorous was uh, due diligence and everything? Was it, were you looked your books opened up and you were looked closely at by by the EDC? Yeah, it was it was very <laughs> very involved. Uh, you know, I started with a full head of hair. You know. <laughs> We had a hair transplant guy in a couple weeks ago. You should talk to him. You know, Rhode Island's economy is struggling. People will be, again, thrilled to hear someone's coming here. Um, I'm curious, especially for your business, what role does state policy play, taxes, regulations, workforce, in, in terms of your ability to grow the company? What, what do you think about what matters as opposed to just what comes in from your customers and, and demand? All that matters. You know, when you're talking about taxation, for example, and any employee's got the burden to carry, uh, you know, services that are provided, and, and not only the taxes are not only income taxes, but property taxes, et cetera, and sales taxes, you know, mm -hmm. across the board. So that's a factor, a big factor. Healthcare is a big factor, and how, what state requirements are thrown on top of whatever other requirements we have. Uh, I mean, anything that runs the costs up for the employee is very difficult, and the employer. And we, uh, we're not without competition. Um, so running the state on a lean basis, like any other state, is a, is a requirement. You can't keep, you know, doling out the money. You mentioned uh, your employees. I, we're only about 30 seconds left, but you hire a lot of engineers. Do you, do you have trouble finding those people, the people or the skilled workers you need for this kind of company? We won't now that we're located more in a metropolitan area. That'll help, definitely. And we have a big pool to pull from here, pull from here. but you know that Rhode Islander from, lives in Providence, he's not going to commute to Pawkatuck. It's too far away. You know? <laughs> What's in Pawkatuck? Uh, uh, it's a nice community. Mm -hmm. um, Industry-wise, there's a few companies down there, but nothing major. Nothing major. Not a, not a metropolis like East Greenwich, so. <laughs> no, not a metropolis like East Greenwich. Actually, it is, uh, well, it's close to Mystic anyway and Westerly. There you go. So, well, great. Well, uh, welcome to Rhode Island, Richard. I want to thank you for being with us. Um, when we come back, will Rhode Island's economy ever perk up, and how do we speed up the process? We'll ask Lori White of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Stick with us on Executive Suite. Welcome back to Executive Suite. I'm Ted Nisi. 
Joining me now is Lori White, president of the Greater Providence Chamber of Commerce. Last time I saw you, it was about 100 degrees out. We were at the JetBlue announcement, which I know is very exciting, but uh, it was pretty warm. It was a very positive day. It was a great day to make a, a hot announcement, I think, as we, we talked about it that, uh, that morning. But yeah, JetBlue coming to town, and that's going to be a real economic driver for Rhode Island, so we're very proud of that. And he spoke very much about the, the, the full court press that the, the chamber and the government officials that everyone made to convince right. them to start up. Well, the chamber hosted a reception for JetBlue a couple of years ago. We brought in the business leaders to uh, um, to court them, if you will, and to share the travel patterns, the data patterns of you know where the businesses were traveling to and where they wanted to have you know, direct flights. So that's really important to the route planners, and they took all that information. And then um, the governor invited uh, me to go to um, um, New York, where mm -hmm. the headquarters of JetBlue is located, and we uh, put on a real Rhode Island show, and we were. Uh, very positive and uh, enthusiastic and told them how much it would mean to uh, TF Green Airport. But at the end, it made good sense from a business perspective for them, and that's what all decisions uh, lead back to. Does it make sense from a business perspective? So this is a great market. And maybe the tip of the spear, they'll, they'll be adding more flights. So we were talking about what to uh, talk about today, and I heard you have, are big on something I've never heard of, so I want to hear about it, mm -hmm. the Cambridge Innovation Center. You're very high on this idea. What is that, and what does it mean for Rhode Island? It's a fantastic place. It's uh, in Cambridge, right, um, right in very close proximity to MIT, and it's a, um, it's a place where entrepreneurs and startup companies and um, entrepreneurial service providers, so venture capital firms and accounting firms, law firms, et cetera, um, it's a it's a big building, and it's uh, they lovingly call it the uh, the ugliest building in the area, <laughs> because it's so pedestrian looking. It's very plain, but it's about 11 stories, and it's filled with startup companies. And what makes it interesting is it's an instant on facility, which means you can go in there, you can um, lease space for a month or a year or um, three months, and it's very flexible. So you have configurations. You could you could lease a desk. You could um, Lisa, a warrant of offices. If you grow, you can add on um, this co-working space. It sounds somewhat like uh, Beta Spring and Ricey. Not the exactly the same, but that same idea of a shared space for new companies. It's a shared space, and what happens is they feed off each other's energy, and they don't have to invest any time or resources in, you know, typical um, overhead like, um, you know, server space. The electric and, bill. And you know, <laughs> it's all you know, fully functional. You can go in. It's turnkey. You sit down. Um, and there's um, hospitality, there's concierge, there's shared conference room. So it's a place where you can really incubate and feed off each other's energy and um, really build a critical mass. So and have I've, they had success with it? It's fantastic. It's been around since the late 90s, and um, it's a for-profit entity um, in, a, in, a non, uh, in a facility owned by MIT. So okay. it's a private developer came in and said, this is a great idea in terms of how do we you know, further build out the critical mass we have with our entrepreneurial startup businesses, these companies that are fast growth. How do we incubate them in a way that makes sense and keeps them all together and they can feed off each each other's expertise. So how having, do we do it here? Yeah, that's that <laughs> is exactly the point. And if you do go over to uh, Beta Spring and the former Ricey space, you know, that's the kind of um, setting and environment that we're really trying to create here because it's very, very exciting. And there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these young companies that are in this Cambridge Innovation Center. Hundreds, Senate. really? Yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's a great thing to see because you can see how that model could be easily replicated because that's one of the things where uh, that entrepreneurs are really bullish about is where can we go? Where is there an environment that makes sense where there's a lot of people that are doing exactly what I'm doing? Now, let me ask you, who would, if we wanted to try something like that in Rhode Island, we, uh, whoever that would be, was this something you think the government needs to take in action? You think this private sector should try to? How would that even come about? Yeah, I think, um, I think it's really something that's, that's private sector driven with uh, government support. And uh, that's what they've done in, in Cambridge. And there are you know, plenty of models on how this might be organized. And you know, there's the, with all the mill buildings that we have in the city, that can be converted to you know, very cool, functional, funky space. 
and even you know who knows even the Superman building in in downtown Providence you know you can look at that and, and envision that perhaps you know it's such an iconic structure that's what I think that would have a lot of appeal to uh, startup companies that would enjoy being part of um, a building that has such a storied legacy but you know there are any number of uh, buildings that could be suitable for that and now you talk to everyone Have you, is there an appetite for this as I, you sort of float I the idea yes I believe there is an appetite for this and I think that um, the success that the Beta Spring portfolio of companies has had and the work that they are doing, Alan Tayer and Melissa Withers and Owen Johnson and Jack Templin, they have really uh, excited the marketplace in terms of, you know, what a very revitalized entrepreneurial climate can do um, for the city, what it can do to keep young talent here, what it can do in terms of partnerships with our colleges and universities. And it's really um, a growth area and it's one that Rhode Island and particularly Providence is particularly well suited for so we're very enthusiastic and excited about that and I think in the in the coming days and weeks you'll uh, you'll see some more activity around that uh, that will take the concept um, even further. You heard, it, you heard it here first on Executive Suite folks. Um, I want to ask about we haven't talked since 38 Studios collapsed. What uh, what's the feeling in the business community about what we just saw? You know, we know just it was a it was a, a, a psychic blow to the state. Mm -hmm. But sort of, what are, what are business people saying about mm -hmm. it? What happened and everything? Yeah, um, well, to to use a journalism term, I think the whole 38 Studios issue will have an intolerable chilling effect on on the economic development uh, landscape, and people won't forget it for a generation. And you think a generation? We, yeah. Yeah, and w but we cannot allow that to happen. And I'm very confident that um, we'll understand. Um, you know what what some of the forces were that that drove that but Rhode Island uh, needs to get back on the horse as we say and these issues the whole issue around economic development and job growth and putting people back to work and creating and sustaining a very competitive tax and regulatory environment is so very critical so we cannot let one um, one uh, situation one company color what we need to do going forward we got to move on it's too important to look back got to ask you one more on you mentioned taxes and regulations I keep hearing people on the left I heard at the State House a lot last session they said we well, you know what? we've done what the chamber said we lowered the taxes and we we've done some stuff on regulations mm -hmm. and unemployment still very high so their ideas don't work what do you say when someone brings that kind of idea to you well you just can't you know flip a switch and expect that suddenly um, 60,000 jobs are going to be absorbed into the marketplace these are structural changes that absolutely have to happen. Um, there are three things that um, governors all across the country are looking at. And Do a quick point, 30 seconds. Yeah, well, first, a competitive tax and regulatory climate, um, focus on high growth entrepreneurial ventures, and understanding the different kinds of small businesses that you have in your community because each one demands a different set of circumstances and services. So, your message is don't let 38 Studios poison the well for all economic development e efforts Can't. in the future. Can't. In there is no choice. All right, well, that's all the time we have this week. I want to thank my guests, Lori White of the Greater Providence Chamber, and on the first half, Richard Scabelli of Yardney Technical Products. And I want to thank you for tuning in here every week on MyRI TV. If you missed the show, you can catch it on our website, WPRI.com. I'm Ted Nisi. We'll see you next week here on Executive Suite.